In today's video, Chinese and Nepalese feminist historical fiction, should it have been on the Booker Prize long list, Soldier Sailor by Claire Kilroy, Can a Death Doula Find Love, The Collected Regrets of Clover, a trans rock star's coming of age story, and Strange Sally Diamond put her recently expired father out with the trash, what's with that? Interesting translated fiction, a Malaysian Australian student moves to Scotland to study Sylvia Plath, and who is the monster in Mary Shelley's classic novel Frank Frankenstein. Also, an incredible 13 DNFs. Hello, I'm Scott. Welcome to Gunpowder Fiction and Plot. And yes, you did hear that correct. I've DNF'd 13 books, which is more than I've finished. I'm a little behind on these recent reads videos. This takes me up to the beginning of September and not the end like everybody else. If you're new here and haven't seen one of these videos before, this is the video I make for you before you go book shopping. Because TBRs are like passion fruit ice cream, foot massage, and the amount of dark matter in the universe. Scientists keep saying we need more. Let's move on to the books and let's tear through these 13 DNFs. The Overstory by Richard Powers. Beautiful writing, an innovative novel, but the point of view of a tree. And this meant the characters were coming and going rapidly. Powers has done a lot of research and really should have written a non-fiction book about trees. This is a real love it or hate it book. Character readers, you should give this one a miss but lovers of nice prose and literature doing something innovative and different, this one's for you. Rather amusingly, I suspect a lot of you will identify with both of those camps. And uh, that's really funny. Banyan Moon by Tao Tai. Historical fiction about a Vietnamese American family during the Vietnam War. Grief, inheritance, resentment sounds like my sort of thing. Dead Mother probably should have been on a certain book prize long list. I wasn't impressed with the writing of this book, however, I didn't think it was bad, I just wasn't in the mood for it, and I wasn't impressed enough to go back to this book. Yeah, a bit of a meh book. I am homeless if this is not my home by Laurie Moore. Words on a page that somebody thinks are linked. I don't often feel confused, but too bored to figure out what's happening at the same time. Humour is nothing if not subjective, and wordplay very rarely impresses me. Even Ali Smith, I am a heathen. This is what I would call B-grade Ali Smith. I'm not the audience for this style of writing. I think there's a bit to do with grief and loss, and there is a talking corpse. If you like Ali Smith, you might want to give this one a try. The Rope Artist by Fuminori Nakamatsu, translated by Sam Brett. Every book so far has had merit. It has had an audience. This, however, is a truly meritless book. Read this only if you want to laugh at how something so terrible got published. This is a murder mystery about the Japanese BDSM scene. And you can see how this book might have been amazing, but it's also a very risky read. I would describe this as Murakami, but without any literary substance. Old Enough, Hayley Jacobson. A messy girl campus novel with queer characters. If you like that and you also like young adult, pick this up. You know, I kind of feel like I'm about to be one of those literary fiction readers who hates on YA. I occasionally do like YA. Good young adult hits all the buttons I like. If you took the protagonist, made her three years younger and put her into high school, this book would be YA, but with maybe a few extra trigger warnings. The writing was really basic and it just had all the characteristic neuroses of a young adult character. I want to give you a quote from the author about this book. I set out to write a book I wished my 16 year old self could have read. A book about a young woman flailing her way into her identity. I just think that this is a novel that has been marketed somewhat incorrectly. I think that this is actually a really good one but it's really important that books are marketed so that you pick them up when you want to read them and, and that the right audience picks them up. I just feel like this one's a bit of a failure by whoever the publisher was. Small Joy's Elvin James Mensha. I think it was Charlie Brooks who reviewed this on her channel and she made it sound brilliant about unexpected friendship and mental health. For me, I just didn't get sucked in. And look, maybe this is where I should address why I've been DNFing so many books. I don't really have a big reason for that though. I've been going on to these like DNF runs where once I DNF once, I suddenly I DNF two or three in a row and it becomes hard to stop DNFing. I've already used up all my tolerance for books starting out slowly and I need something right now. A lot of the joy I get from reading is sort of a delayed reward. There are a lot of books 
that when I start reading them, I'm not into them straight away. But as they develop, I get sucked in and I need that extra patience. A lot of books, they need to develop their characters and their world so that they can win you over. And I just didn't have the patience for this book. I think I really did get read at a bad time and failed to grab my attention. I definitely was a little bit moody towards the books I was reading on that day. Amazan Mon Amour, Katia Oskamp. This is a book about aging. It's half fiction, half memoir about a district in Berlin and I just found the characters really unpleasant. Normally reading about a cranky old person is actually my idea of heaven but I didn't find anything endearing about them nor did I find anything interesting or curious. There was no empathy. There's there's nothing to read this for. Mother for dinner, Shalom Osterland. Mum's dead, her last request was we eat her, a comedy horror about a family who for religious reasons are cannibals. I think we all know that this book is a risk, but I can't look at that description and not find out if it's good or not. Very few times do I read a book and think I could have done better. I'm just not a very good writer. I've never even finished writing a novel. But if I did write, it would be weird comedy. This is a fantastic idea that has unfortunately been wasted. Where'd you go, Bernadette? Maria Semple. Scott DNF's another comedy. You think I'd hate that genre or something? I don't. I actually love it, but I have very high standards. I'm also wondering just how cultural comedy is at the moment. I think we've all watched enough British and US comedy shows to see the difference in humour and to have a favourite of the two of them. I'm really happy to read a mediocre Terry Pratchett book, but this book just didn't make me laugh and that's why I picked it up. Supper Club, Laura Williams. This is a book about a group of women who form an underground eating club. It's hyper feminist. The women all begin to gain weight or I really want to say size or space. I was really looking forward to reading a book that called out diet culture as a way of controlling women and learning about the joys a group of women took from the subversive act of eating. It sounds delicious. Unfortunately, the execution just didn't match the potential. Characters really blended. They were indistinct. Changes of point of view didn't affect the writing at all. It lacked depth of discussion and everything just became so samey. The themes didn't develop and there was no plot. There was only one character in this novel. They were just cloned multiple times. Great idea for a novel. Ripe by Sarah Rose Etta. Science fiction that starts by getting the science wrong and then turning it into a really obvious and clunky metaphor. Blah. How We Survived Communism and Even Laughed. This is a memoir come essay collection of somebody who grew up in Yugoslavia or Croatia. This book had its moments. I loved the conversation it had around makeup, how it is seen as a luxury, how there is very little variety, how women paint it on because that's what they have. And often without it matching because that's all they've got. They don't have the choice. They can't match their skin tones. This gave me a real appreciation of the women and the reality of their daily existence. But it got published in 1991 and this is just Cold War propaganda for the USA. I wanted an account of life in Yugoslavia before it all went to war with itself. Daily existence. I want to empathize with humanity and understand it. I don't need overly simplistic rhetoric that blames an economic policy for tyrannical leaders and ignores those same problems existing in the West as if the overall problem isn't a hierarchical pyramid of power. Also, this book has a terrible structure. Put the people first, put the politics second, that might have worked. The constant ranting took me away from the characters and the issues that I wanted to learn about. The Siren of Mars, Sarah Stewart Johnson. A book that's focusing on the search for life on Mars sounds really interesting, especially with a lot of the science coming out lately, pointing out the prospect of water being on there and the very real prospect of life being on Mars in the past. I was really looking forward to just having a good old science geek out with this book. One of the real risks I find with science nonfiction is that there is a whole bunch of interesting stuff that doesn't take anything like two to three hundred pages to explain. Sarah Stewart Johnson decides to fill that extra detail by turning the science nonfiction into a memoir and it was boring. I've studied astrophysics, I've studied astronomy. Astronomy is a combination of some of the most interesting stuff you can learn about in science and some stuff that is so boring that 
teaching it may actually violate the Geneva Convention. Sarah Stewart Johnson is talking about their love for the night sky and telescopes and locating stars and I decided if I wanted to read about somebody being miserable and psychologically torturing themselves I'd just pick up a Thomas Hardy novel. The DNFs are over we are going to go from the worst book I finished to the best book I finished. Frankenstein, Mary Shelley. Two of my favourite booktubers, Ange from Ange's Bookish Chatter and Jack from Spread Book Joy, decided to run a group readathon for this. Now, I joined in, I started, I joined the chat, we changed versions, or rather, I changed versions. I got behind, I got ahead, I got very confused, and I wasn't very active. But I did appreciate the chat and the, the wonderful members of that chat and uh, their insight and thoughts. Frankenstein is a lot of people's favourite novel ever, but this is my second time reading it and I didn't like it then so why reread it? I've changed my mind so much as a reader. I like to give books a second chance especially books that I have strong opinions on. They're the ones I often change my minds on. Wuthering Heights is, is a perfect example of me going from hating a book to really enjoying it. So did I change my mind on Frankenstein? I, I honestly, I, I really did. Did I like it? No, sorry, I didn't. The one star rating on my Goodreads account is incorrect, but I'd probably go so far as to only give it two stars this time. I wonder if this book is really a victim of its own success. The question of who is the monster, Dr. Frankenstein or his creation is so cliche. I find it so hard to put myself into the head of Shelley or one of her contemporaries into a world where Frankenstein isn't one of the most instantly recognisable faces. I mean, Scooby-Doo included Frankenstein as a special guest one episode. Shelley has honestly created two of the most unlikable characters in literature. This book is basically the equivalent of putting an incel and a far-right media mogul in the same room and watching them fight. He might be 90 years old and a little bit defenseless, but you're still supporting the incel and you're not even feeling bad about it. The monster feels like the universe owes him somebody to love. The monster's an incel. The monster is a climate denier sending out memes defending Prince Andrew. There's literally a scene where the monster is blackmailing Frankenstein to make him a wife and he basically says if she's hideous she can't leave me yeah that's not toxic I mean he really is that guy on tinder that starts conversations by asking if you're a sub I can see why people like this book though it is toxic masculinity fighting toxic classism unrecognized privilege turned into a horror novel it shows us how little humans have changed in the last 200 and five years. It's just too whiny for me. The characters are so pathetic. Wah, nobody loves me. Wah, he's murdered my whole family and everybody I've ever loved. Wah. I can see why people love this, but there wasn't even that charismatic hatred you have for, say, a Heathcliff or the protagonist from my year of rest and relaxation that makes unlikable characters so juicy and delicious to read about. My Husband, Maud Ventura, translated by Emma Ramadan. This is kind of fun trash. You know how translated fiction doesn't always conform to English-speaking genres? I do find this a little bit hard to classify. It's kind of a dark romance, but it feels like a thriller. It hints that it's going to get really gritty and a bit literary. That's kind of disappointing because it doesn't. Translated from French, this book is about a woman who is obsessed with her husband who is kind of mistreating her and she's acting up and she's keeping score and punishing him. This whole book is told from the point of view of the wife and I wouldn't say that she's an unreliable narrator but you're definitely restricted to her point of view to see what she sees, to know what she knows, to hear her twisted and broken logic. In the way that every narrator is a little bit unreliable, she's unreliable to the extreme. I expected this book to slowly unravel and to go somewhere dark and gritty and uncomfortable and lovely. Unfortunately, it's not the book that it was. It was a little bit too plot focused. It was basically a thriller with sex, love and cheating instead of murder, stabbing and poisoning. I guess it's a psychological romance? The ending was clever and cute, but not really worth it. And if it was intended to be funny, then it kind of is. But if it was intended to be a commentary on society, it's, um, 
a bit repugnant. I just feel like this book is a little bit lost in the translation. The woman who climbed trees, Smriti Ravinda. One of the things that this book discussed that I found really interesting was the idea of borders and identities. I have crossed the border from Lumundi in Nepal into India on foot and it's a free crossing. It's really busy. People live there. People live down this street and at one point it's Nepal and at another point it's India. And as I crossed I followed the crowd and I knew I was in Nepal and 300 meters later I was relatively sure I wasn't in Nepal anymore but there was nothing there and I had to walk back and in order to get my passport stamped I had to go into a special building to the side which was basically like a milk bar it was so unofficial and so seamless and so blended the demarcation of these two lands is so weird to me and when i was walking around nepal i was seeing the faces change from long to round or from light to dark or whatever the feature was that was changing there was never really that culture shock from one place to another i mean there was the culture shock of landing at the airport and witnessing it for the first time once you sort of got there that things just slowly changed and that's one of the themes in this book an Indian living in Nepal and Nepali living in India what do these things really mean when your grandparents are a mixture of Indian and Nepali this is a side plot but for me it is one of the most interesting parts of this book Mina is struggling with her identity one thing she must ask is is she Nepalese or is she Indian Mina is 14 she is from India she is about to marry Mohammed, a 21-year-old Nepalese student. The story is both a multi-generational story and a coming-of-age story focused on Mina, who is about to experience a series of miscarriages. And as she ages and becomes stronger and more independent, it explores the different types of love one woman can have for her husband, for her country. It is critical of the patriarchy within Nepalese culture, specifically specifically early marriage and early motherhood and how these things limit women in the future. There is a lot of good things here but it didn't quite work for me. The title refers to an event in the book. The author definitely feels that this is an important event. I feel it could have been cut. I'm left wondering what did her climbing a tree add? Did I miss something? Is it because I'm a westerner reading a Nepalese novel? Maybe this isn't the best book but it is an author who I hope continues to write who has an interesting voice and somebody who I think is very close to being the first Napoli author to really break through. The Collected Regrets of Clover, Mickey Bramner. Clover is a death duel, a job they're excellent at. They have no friends their own age and seem to only make connections with people in hospices. They regularly attend group sessions for people suffering from grief due to the loss of a loved one, constantly moving from group to group so they never are recognised. Then one day they meet Finn, who just so happens to recognise Clover from another group session they attended together. Flynn is annoying in how he remembers Clover and insists on doing things like talking to her, asking her how her day's been. Finn's grandmother is terminally ill, a fact that they're keeping from her as they're pretending life is completely normal. Finn, however, decides to hire Clover, but asks her to keep quiet. And this is all set up to be a classic fake dating love story. While there are romantic elements to this book, I wouldn't call it a romance. It's really not a will-they-won't-they they love story. As you can probably see, Clover is pretty messed up herself and needs to figure things out. She has a very cool old lady to cancel and help. She is still feeling guilty about her grandfather who died while she was in Japan. And this is a real coming-of-age story about an older person who is around the age of 40. But in the framing of a love story, the description of this might make you think it's somehow similar to something like Get a Life, Chloe Brown. That is not what this book is. There are some big issues in here and they're not shied away from but it never really goes to that deeper level. I was waiting for this book to take my breath away, to make me feel something new and it never did. I liked being in this world. I enjoyed the ride. It is a successful book but it's lacking that wow. It kind of feels like 
you know that the author is talented. They're doing all the right things, but they're concentrating so hard on not stuffing it up. They're just not letting go and they're not taking any risks and injecting something glorious into this book. This is definitely on the more accessible side of literary fiction. It's really good for somebody who is new to that genre. Misery readers would call this book a really good palate cleanser too. And I think that anybody who isn't into miserable books will be asking, what on earth is wrong with you? Atomic Habits, James Clear. Look, this is a self-help book. I think you probably all know about this book, but it was really useful to me. And I say to me, I acknowledge that everybody is at a different point of their life and they need different things. And I'm specifically working on creating routine and order in my life. So I'm going to be slightly defensive here because I know self-help books, they have this stigma attached to them. I just want to say two things. Nobody is in a perfect place. It's normal to struggle with something with some part of your life. And if you wanted to get fit and you read a book about running, as an example, there's no judgment in that at all. And that's one of the examples used in this book. That stigma is stupid. Work on yourself, whatever form that might take. Exercise, learning a new language, going to therapy, fixing your sleep. It has many forms. These are all good things. I'm just going to give you one of the tips here as a sample. If you find this tip useful, you might like to read the whole book. If you don't find this tip useful, you probably don't need to read the book. So let's go to the you want to get fit habit. For example, you might want to go to the gym every day or you might want to go for a run. You don't make the habit going to the gym or going for a run. You make the habit driving to the gym. You make the habit putting your shoes on. Once you go to the gym, once you put your running shoes on, you're unlikely to go back home. You're unlikely to take those shoes off. I think we can all agree that those things are easier than working out. So you just create that small habit that chains into to a big habit. Lady Tang's Circle of Women, Lisa C. This is essentially a cradle to grade story inspired by Tan Yak Sin. Tan was a 15th century Chinese physician who wrote the book Miscellaneous Records by a female doctor, which includes 31 cases she treated, which cover a range of different issues. This is a book that really delivers on the expectations you have of such a novel. I learned about 15th century China, about the role of women at the time, about the medicine they used at the time, about foot binding, the relationship formed by different women at the time, the classism and sexism within the society, segregation of the genders, polygamy and relationships relationship dynamics. This is a really well-balanced book. The character work is nice, the plot is engaging, and the plot and characters are very well balanced with the themes and the setting. Lisa C has done her research and has educated me about a person from history in a place and a time that I did not know much about, and she has entertained me at the same time. What more do you want in a historical fiction novel? My criticism of this book is not really about anything Thing that it did, but more about what it didn't do. There are quite a few issues in this book that could have commanded an entire book. Something like foot binding was really interesting and you could have built an entire book around it. I did not know that the women who foot bound literally risked their lives as a result of this. I didn't realize that it had class attached to it. As I've said, this issue could have demanded an entire book. I don't think it should have been this book. This book took an overview approach and I just wanted that little bit more juice. A very satisfactory good novel. We're at the point of this video where if you don't want to add books to your TBR, you need to switch off. Little Eyes, Samantha Sweblin. This is a weird book. Kentikis are these kind of robot pet things. They are connected to the internet and somebody else somewhere in the world controls them. Always the same person. They have a charging point, let them run out of power, they die. Should the person somewhere on the internet disconnect from them intentionally, they die. This world, this idea is explored through a series of people with different Kentikis. Abusive people, a woman who allows her Kentiki to watch her in the shower, somebody who is farming Kentikis to make money, somebody who has been blackmailed by their Kentiki. Legitimate friendship between a person and their Kentiki. Old people using them for connection. Old people 
having their Kentikis commit suicide right in front of them. One of these Kentiki operators witnesses a crime and has to figure out where they are while keeping their Kentiki alive from the criminal. One of the Kentikis tries to gain liberation from their owners. It seems like a pretty wacky piece of translated fiction, but this book is really about human connection, about love and friendship, and what it takes to be seen as human, and how that level of remove changes people's behavior. You could look at the treatment of Kentikis in this novel in the same way that we treat almost any minority in our society. I think this is a really excellently created parallel because if you say read a book about an abusive relationship and the author takes the first person narrative, there is a choice of perspective there. I think most readers would prefer to read that book from the point of view of the victim rather than the monster. It is easy for us to empathize with somebody being mistreated and somebody doing the horrible things. I think most of us acknowledge that reading something like Lolita is at the very least very uncomfortable. We see some depraved acts in this book, but the discomfort isn't there because they're a robot. Imagine a movie scene where a man is really upset. He's been unlucky in love. His mother has died. He's just gotten fired. And then he's dropped a jar of pasta sauce and it's smashed all over his kitchen floor. So he gets a cricket bat and he starts smashing a punching bag until he cries. You're going to feel for that man. But if all that happened and instead of smashing a punching bag, he smashes his ex, you're going to go from wanting to hug him to wanting to vomit on him. And this is what this book is really good at removing. It opens you up to empathizing with these emotions that these people have, why these depraved acts happen. You have to accept that in this book, there is an activist group that are trying to liberate Kentikis, that are seeing Kentikis as human. In this book, Kentikis really are human. It creates this double think of Kentikis aren't humans because you can't see them as anything other than robot pets. Yet you know intellectually that they're humans in this book. And that curates your emotions and your understandings of the people in such an intelligent way. This is a book about loneliness, validation, self-esteem, money, companionship, anger. This is just a book about human nature. And I think the Kentikis are such an intelligent way of stripping back the things we see first. And it's forcing us to see that next level of things. It's a really exceptionally clever piece of literary fiction. But the girl, Jessica Zan Mi Yu, an unnamed Australian protagonist of Malaysian background known only as Girl, travels from Australia to Scotland to study Sylvia Plath. There's a lot going on in this book. What do we think when a young woman is studying Plath? a woman who took her own life. If The Bell Jar was published today, it would be called autofiction. You probably already know that it contains sexual violence and mental illness, and that those things are widely considered to have contributed to Platt's suicide. But let's talk about identity. And it always makes me curious when an author doesn't name their protagonist. This is somebody who is young, who doesn't know who they are yet, who doesn't know where they fit in, who is figuring all that out, who doesn't even want to say that they love Plath, even though the woman is studying them. I don't think that it's by chance that they're unnamed. Lack of identity is one of the major causes of depression too. And it just links it back to the Plath thing so cleverly. Now let's add race into this. There are quite a few scenes of racism in the bell jar and the rest of Plath's works too. And they're discussed in this novel. The question of whether Plath was representing racism or was racist was addressed. And I think it can be quite persuasively argued that both of those things are true. Particularly discussed are the themes in Plath's work that talk about Jewish people and of course Asian people, which is the first time girls see somebody like herself represented in Plath's art. Maybe he goes some way to explain why she doesn't want to say that she loves Platt. It's quite an exclusionary thing to see the only representation of you in a text be the subject of casual racism. And how do other Asian literary students deal 
with that. Sylvia Plath is certainly not the only author with this in their catalogue, and she is far from the most problematic. At the same time, Girl, as the name suggests, is a girl, and does she owe Plath a feminist debt of gratitude? It's as if half of this novel is screaming, take Plath out of the canon, and the other half is screaming, we have to keep her. It really demonstrates the importance of being intersectional in any kind of social justice or advocacy. It demonstrates the issues that we have when we begin to worship dead authors. Girls struggle with Plath are also represented with her struggles with academia. They're in fact identical, not being considered, not being thought about, not being educated to, having her needs be secondary. And class is really central to this too, with girl being a working class. Person. Let's throw in competitive academic female friendship, the love hate relationship that girl has with a white upper class English girl who is painting girl's portrait for the class. Very literally, the only Asian character at this school is being represented by an upper class English person who at times is vocally prickly and exclusionary of girl. Often when I sit down and I figure out what I'm going to say about a book, the book improves. That process really helps me understand and appreciate what the author is doing. But I don't think a book has ever quite improved as much as this book has. This is a very multi-layered novel. Everything feeds back into itself and the more you think about this book, the more it becomes a tangled knot of juicy delicious metaphor. This is quite brilliant. Any other city Hazel Jane Plant. Hazel Jane Plant is an author you all need to start reading. Tracy is a trans woman who is also the lead singer of a punk rock band, The Static Saints. This is a book about art, female friendship, being queer, and it includes a lot of sex. Like for maybe 50% of this novel, at least one person isn't wearing pants. This book is excellent, but big warning on the sex. This book is spicy, and you know when you order food and people say, watch out, it's it's spicy and then the food comes out with jalapenos on it and you're like, really? This book starts with Habanero, but then it takes you all the way to Carolina Reaper. And I'm going to tell you something funny. I was listening to this as an audiobook and I audiobook while I walk Bryn, my dog. Bryn is cute. Bryn likes children. Children like Bryn. I don't often see people when I walk. I'm wearing big red headphones. You can kind of hear what I'm listening to. As I was listening to this audiobook, there was a very detailed sexual act in this book. It was quite instructional. I felt like I learnt things. And this sexual act, let's just say it goes all the way up to your wrist. I turn the corner on my walk and there are these two girls who would have been three and four, maybe three and five, and they see Bryn and they charge towards him. And I'm trying to keep calm because he's very excited and just wants to jump on them and lick them. Which is not good for children because he knocks them over and hurts them. And I'm listening to what could basically be described as one of the most perverse sexual acts I have ever heard in an instruction manual. And I think that they can hear it. And I'm trying to control my dog. And then I'm worried that their parents are approaching me. And I'm desperately trying to pause my filth while keeping the dog calm so that these two children can pat him. And I just think if you're going to listen to this audiobook, listen to it around the house or little in-ear headphones, not over-ear headphones. Let's talk about the book. Two timelines. One of them is in the 1990s. One of them is set in today's state, presented as side A and side B, which is quirky and I enjoyed that, but is probably had a little bit too much made of it online. The book explores trauma and how art is used as healing and about queer friendship. I was particularly captivated by Tracy being drawn to an older trans artist before she had transitioned. I was trying to determine if Tracy was drawn to her because she was an egg and was just generally in awe of trans women, or if she was drawn to her because she was an aspiring artist who was being drawn to a very bold artist. I think that this is a really powerful way of demonstrating that trans need, that urge to seek out people who have already transitioned, the non-sexual attraction they have to the wider trans figures in their community, and that feeling being expressed through a young 
artists or in admiration of an older artist. As a cis person, I'm never going to know the experience of what it is like to see gender fulfillment in somebody who has transitioned, but I can totally understand that art thing. That was really clever. I also love how Tracy mentions asking Hazel Jane Plant to help her write the memoir because there are so many examples of female friendship and queer female friendship and trans friendship in this novel. It was just so demonstrative of the supporting community and explained the book and made a complete mockery of that death of the author argument, which is one of the most absurdly idiotic arguments in literary circles, in my opinion. Being trans takes a lot of shapes and there are different ways people do it and I think it's cool to see all of them and this is the first time I've read a book that discusses bottom surgery the realities of a trans vagina how orgasms change infections because you still enjoy the other stuff too and you can't swap in all directions there's a real vulnerability to Hazel Jane Plant's writing you're not sure when she's including her own experiences and pushing them onto her characters and sharing them with you when she's doing that with her friend's experience or when she's have researched things and when you consider that this book is a fake memoir and when you read a memoir you really want to read about somebody's struggles and victories in a memoir you want to see a more intimate side of things and that's exactly what this book is delivering to you and Hazel Jane Plant's character work is out of this world good soldier sailor Claire Kilroy I think very few people will walk away from this book and have anything less to say than it's a very good book. I think that this is a safe four or five star read for just about everybody. I don't like the should it have been on the Booker Prize discussion in general, but in this case, I think Claire Kilroy could be a little bit justified in feeling rather unlucky. The book takes the form of a monologue from mother to her son, and it exists outside of time. So you get comments about discovering motherhood and the changes it had on soul soldier, the conversation about what kind of a man sailor should be. One of the things that comes across really strongly is that change of identity childbirth brings. You're not a mother, you give birth, you are a mother. This is also very clearly a mother and a son book. This would not be the same book if you changed her gender or his sex. It's nurturing and feminists. It is socially critical acknowledging how society will push him into different roles and having her feel scared for him but it's a warning to him and advice to him all at the same time. Don't mistreat women. It manages to look forward with hope and fear. It is a kaleidoscope of emotions. It is a love letter. It is a mother confessing her love to her child. I am not usually a big fan of the marriage of writing style to themes or feelings that the author is trying to get across. I can see it. I don't dislike it. I can acknowledge what the author is trying to do. But normally, I just want characters, themes, plots and ideas. I want them all separately and I want my head to explode with thoughts and to be taken on an emotional journey. Writing style is more of a hurdle than it is a selling point to me. But this book is delivered in this chaotic semi stream of consciousness style which is very much not my thing but not only does it work it really adds to the emotion of this book it really adds that every time aspect to this level it creates an urgency and a panic to this novel it makes you want to continue reading it communicates the worry the mother has what sort of man am I bringing into this world but what I really love about this writing style is that it has highbrow literary heft, but it is super accessible. You could see this being a textbook studied at high school or at postgraduate level. I would have hated studying this text, but I really loved reading this book. A book that you like instantly get, but then it explodes, not all at once into something devastating, but in lots of little pops that create a deeper impression. I have two books left, a fiction and a non-fiction, and I find it very hard to rank non-fiction in general, but in comparison to fiction, it is nigh on impossible. It's like comparing a good meal to being well rested. I'm going to leave the fiction to last because while I like non-fiction, fiction is my favourite. The Myth of Normal, Gabor and Daniel Maté. I love this book. This explores how things we take as normal in Western culture, things such as stress, trauma and hardship, are creating illness 
A lot of this is about trauma. Mate is sure to define the difference between what he calls capital T trauma, for example, assault or a car accident, and trauma, which includes capital T trauma, but also includes things like not getting what you need as a child or leaving a relationship where your trust has been violated. Trauma is something we almost all experience in a capitalist society. It is really an inescapable capable part of our life. Who has never been in financial difficulties, been the victim of bullying or violence, never been yelled at by their boss, stressed out about a deadline or getting a parking ticket, worked a 20 hour day just to get things done, or been involved in a situation where they are quite frankly lucky to be alive? I put my hand up for every single one of those things. And I don't think I'm special or disadvantaged. For goodness sakes, I'm a straight white middle class man. I'm playing on easy mode. And all these things that I'm talking about that are fucking horrible are normal parts of our life. Maday explores the growing body of evidence that links our normal life to diabetes, to neurodiversity, to autoimmune disease, to cancer, to mental illness. He includes a discussion of intergenerational trauma, including an intimate experience of his own life. An example of where he overreacted to something his wife did. She got mixed up and ran late to pick him up at the airport. And he acted really badly to her and didn't speak to her for a few days. But he also talks about how that brought up memories of his mother abandoning him during the Holocaust and how that trauma has controlled and influenced him in his daily life and how he's passed that down to his children. He discusses the gap between medical research and medical practice. He talks about childbirth and how he as a doctor used to give terrible advice which he believed to be true based on zero or very little evidence but was and still is in a lot of cases standard practice. He is very critical of the healthcare system and he is Canadian. It is not the stereotypical criticism of the US healthcare system but the sort of malpractice that the rest of the world can understand too. If you're at all interested between the links between mental and physical health read this book. I learned so much. Not just interesting stuff, but useful stuff. Things that changed the way I think about and approached my health. This is just an outstanding piece of non-fiction. You cannot recommend this highly enough. Strange Sally Diamond. Liz Nougat. This is a really interesting place to transition into Strange Sally Diamond. In many ways, these two books would be good read back to back or at the same time. This book starts with Sally Diamond putting her father out with the trash. He always said when he died, put my body out with the trash. So she did. She didn't feel sad about it. She was just doing what he asked. The police found out when Sally went to claim her benefits. Being known to the admin staff, they asked if she wanted to pick up her father's benefits at the same time. Sally replied, no thanks, he won't be needing them, he died. Collecting her benefits, she left to do her shopping. Sally Diamond is a character that presents as very neurodiverse. She's cleared of any serious wrongdoings, but this all opens up her mystery. Her father has left her three letters to be opened a week after. Apart. When I review a novel, sometimes I need to make a call between exactly what I tell you this book is about and leaving you all ignorant so that when you read the book, you can let the plot unravel and feel all the surprises and ups and downs yourself. This is a character focused novel. But it's also a plot focused novel. Liz Nougat does such a fantastic job of building these little pieces of suspense and intrigue and revealing them one at a time. I don't want to take that away from you, even if it means that I can't tell you the major themes of this novel, even if it means fewer of you will read this absolutely incredible book. Imagine if Daphne du Maurier wrote Eleanor Oliphant and added a touch of In Cold Blood. Is it a psychological thriller? Is it a literary? fiction. I don't really know. It is really dark in places, but also it has so many ups and downs. I don't think that this is the saddest book anybody will ever read, but you really got to check the trigger warnings if you have any trigger warnings at all. And I know this is sounding a little bit like it's a cheap genre fiction book, but oh, there's so much emotional depth. It is so character clever. It's so rich. I think we're pretty obsessed with genre when we market books, and this book doesn't fit nicely into a genre, and it just demonstrates the rich world of entertaining and emotionally complex books we're missing out on by following those marketing rules. What Nougat does is 
nothing short of incredible. There are multiple really thrilling back-to-back -back stories that make you understand exactly who Sally is, exactly why she acts the way she acts. It's so emotionally intelligent. It is so rich and devastating. I have never witnessed a book pull off being so fast paced and so reflective before. I had a really good time reading this. I do think fans of Emma Donoghue or Sarah Waters, that sort of fun commercial end of literary fiction will really enjoy this, but it's so emotionally complex and dark as fuck too. Thank you to my wonderful patrons for their support. If you're new here, please make sure to remember to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and I hope you found some good books to read. Bye-bye.